Genesis chapter number 26 this morning. Genesis chapter number 26. Genesis chapter number 26. I don't remember a time when it wasn't a special day that we've had as big a crowd as we've got today. And I'm glad the church family's here. Today is not just a, a sermon or a message, but I believe designed to steer us in the direction God would have us to go moving forward. As we look around the room, the building is full. God's blessing, and we must be good stewards of what God is doing for us here at this church. Genesis chapter number 26 and verse number 15, if you're there, say amen. If you do not have a Bible or an inspired iPhone, one of the two. Uh, you can look on the screens and follow along with me. Genesis chapter number 26, verse number 15. For any of you all that have been with us for a couple years, or at least since I've been here, this is going to sound familiar to you. One of the sermons that I preached when I think even before I came the, became the pastor of this church but the Holy Ghost told me to go back to it again the Bible says in verse number 15 for all the wells which, fa which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth and Abimelech said unto Isaac go from us for thou art much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham and he called their names after the names by which his father had called them and Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water and the herdmen of Gerard did strive with Isaac's herdmen saying the water is ours and they called the name of the well Esek because they strove with him and they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence and digged another well. And for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us. That's what we need to pray for God to do for us is that the Lord would make room for us. Y'all didn't get that. If y'all all invited your friends next Sunday, where are you going to put them? It's a good problem to have. But the blessing in this well digging business for Isaac is when he got to the end of it, he called it Rehoboth, saying, The Lord hath made room for us. Father, in, Je in Jesus' name, we do ask you to touch your word. I ask you, Lord, to speak to us, help us. And Lord, do for us what only you can do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, You can be seated. It is within, I, within Genesis chapter number 26. Isaac 
is living in this occupied territory with Abimelech and these other kings and God blessed and favors Isaac. The same blessing that it was on Abraham is now passing through generationally to Isaac. And God is using and manifesting his promises in and through the life of Isaac. Within this process, God so favors and blesses and honors Isaac. That Abimelech and these guys come to him and say, we, we need you to go. Verse number 16, Abimelech said to Isaac, go from us for thou art much mightier than we. People are intimidated by the favor of God on your life. Not every circle that you get kicked out of is a judgment on your life or a chastisement on your life. Sometimes God removes you from circles because he heard a conversation that you didn't hear. Sometimes God removes you from a circle because God's vision for your life is much bigger than the area in which you're planted in that current season. I'm like you. I get mad. I get upset when things get disrupted. But we must understand that Abimelech is not in control of Isaac's life. God is in control of Isaac's life. And the people around you that seemingly have hurt you are not in control of your life. God is in control of your life. He is the one. I need a good amen right here. From the, all the way from the balcony. I need to hear some. He's the one that opens doors that no man can shut. And he is the one that shuts doors that no man can open. He's God and he is the one that is in control of your destiny. Here's your little side sermon. Let them walk. If they can walk, let them walk, honey. I want in my life the people that God has put in my life. I don't want to have to beg nobody to stay my friend. No, no, no. I'm going to be a good friend. Matter of fact, my new little role, my little, my little role that David Gibbs told me this when he was here. You don't have to be my friend for me to be your friend. I'm going to be the person God has called me to be. But how you respond to that has no tension at all on the destiny in which God is launching my life towards. We give people way too much power in our life. And that sinks us into anxiety, fear, and discouragement, and depression. If you could get a vision of the God we were singing about just a little bit that is seated upon the throne. In full control at all times. The economy in heaven may be going, the economy in earth may be going crazy right now, but the economy in heaven is perfectly fine. Everything is completely under control. And Isaac leaves. And when he goes to the next place, I believe he departed thence and, and, and went, went to Gerar, G-E-R-A-R, -R, and dwelt there. Well, if I'm going to live here, I've got to dig a well. In those days, a well was not just to drink. It was a source of life in those desert areas. A well meant life. A well meant heritage. And a well meant ownership. Now, Isaac's daddy, Abraham, had within his lifetime dug wells all over the place. The Philistines, which are always a type of the enemy, death and hell, comes to where I, Abraham had dug these wells and covered them with earth. Covered up these wells. Because the devil always wants to try to cover up and destroy a life source. He always wants to destroy our heritage. And he wants to take any ground away that we claim in the name of Jesus. And so the Philistines have taken over this part of the country and 
taken over these wells. So they're saying we're destroying life and we now own this. Isaac, when he goes to this land of this valley of Gerar in verse 18, I love this text. Probably three or four years ago now that I talked about this. And Isaac digged again, everybody say again, again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham and called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdman and Gerard did strive with Isaac's herdman, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of it the well Esek, because they strove with him. I've only got two points today to preach. And I'm hot, so I'm taking off my jacket. I plan on preaching quick today because i got a lot to talk about. Uh, this is going to bother me too, so I'm going to take that off while I'm at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Number one, Isaac's vision. You say, it bothers me when you preach without a tie. Well, you get in 90 degrees and wear a tie, and then we'll talk about it, all right? I, Isaac's vision. Isaac has a vision, a purpose, a goal, and a plan that is centered around life. It's centered around heritage, and it's centered around ownership. That he is going to dig again the wells of water that his father had dug that the Philistines had filled up with earth. He had a vision to fix what the enemy had messed up. He had a vision to sustain the growth in which God was blessing him with. Isaac has a vision he has a drink, whatever you want to call it. He has a plan, a goal, a death, whatever term you want to put there. Isaac is determined to dig again the wells that the enemy had covered up. And in this process, he digs a well. And the Philistines, the, the herdsmen come. They didn't dig the well. They didn't pay no money. They didn't have any sweat in working to dig the well but once the well starts producing water they said that's ours don't that sound just like the world you ever worked hard for something and then somebody that has no involvement at all in it wants to come take what you've worked hard for uh-huh well surely Isaac is just going to give up and quit digging the wells now. No. Isaac moves to another place and says, get your shovels out, boys. Let's find another one. And they dig another well. And guess what they find? Another well. And here comes the same, I'm trying to think of a nice word to say, Loafers, um, no, I, I'm going to stop. Uh, freeloaders, I was thinking of political terms, but I ain't going to get into that. I, I, they didn't have nothing to do with it, and here they come. That's ours. Well, surely, Mr. Isaac, you've dug two wells now. Your vision, your plan, your purpose, your goal, it's not working out very well for you. Surely you're going to give up and quit now. But yet, Isaac says, come on, we're going to another place. And they go to another place and they dig again. And this was the place where when they dug, they found a springing well of water and they called it Rehoboth and there was no strife for some reason or other. There was no strife over this well of water. They called it Rehoboth saying, the Lord has made room for us. What if Isaac would have gave up on his dream and his goal after the very first well got stolen from him? Here's what I know about people. If you're still here, alive and breathing, God has a purpose.
and a plan. Listen to the preacher now. And a destiny for your life. If you're still breathing, God's not done. If you're still breathing, God is not done. And it is in with all of us that when we come up against obstacles, when we face a storm, when we find a problem, something in us says, well, maybe I heard God wrong. Maybe I'm missing it. Maybe I made the wrong move. Maybe I'm not supposed to be where I am. Obstacles in your life do not necessarily mean you're on the wrong track. They could very well mean you're on the right track. The devil's been doing this for a long time. And I believe he can recognize and sense destiny and purpose and the divine plan of God in the life of people. And those are the people that hell is going to attack with everything in his power. But I, before I move on to my sermon, I got to encourage what I would consider to be some of the best church members in the whole world for you not to give up on your dream. And one thing they said when we was on staff retreat a week or two, one of the people said this, that you got to remember why you got in this thing in the first place. You've got to remember your original why. You've got to go back to the beginning and remember why you set your sales. For every business owner in here, this would apply. For every family in this room, this would apply. For every person in this room, this ought to apply. You've got to go back and say and remember when you were down at the bottom of the barrel and when God gave you enough fortitude to say, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to do something for the glory of God. You've got to go back to that place in your mind and remember the why that you and the Holy Ghost settled on when you picked yourself up out of the ashes and say, God, I may die trying, but I'm going to give my life going after everything. I don't want to live average. I don't want to live normal. I don't want to die complacent. Everybody else may sit on the boat, but I'm going to get out of the boat. I'm going to walk on the water to where Jesus is. Everybody else may accept average. Everybody else may accept normal. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want every, I do not want to live my life and look back saying, man, I wish I'd have gave it more. I wish I'd have tried harder. I wish I'd to trust to God more. I wish I'd have lived with more faith. No, 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 no. In this little brief lifetime that we have, maybe it, maybe it testified of us that we gave God every ounce of life that we had. Maybe it testified that when we came up against obstacles, that we did not allow the obstacles to stop us or to kill us, but that we stood up and said, if God be for me, then who can be against me? Let walk who walks. Let stay who stays. But I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk with God And I refuse to give up on the dream that God has given me In this room is a man or a woman That inside your soul God birthed a dream of a ministry Maybe God birthed a dream of a business Maybe God birthed a dream in your heart of a family I don't know what it is But hell has attacked that dream with everything he's got to the point that you have followed the devil's pattern and you have just sat down and said enough is enough I can't take this no more get up get up the Holy Ghost if you're saved the Holy Ghost lives on the inside of you and the people of God were never designed to get knocked down and stay down uh, greater is he that is in me when I was a little kid my mama and my daddy got me for a little bit I thought I was going to be a boxer and mom and daddy got tired of me punching the doors and the, 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 the walls uh, and, and, and you know I yeah, I hit the hit the the uh, sheetrock wall and put little dents in it. My mama beat me over it. Yeah, y'all pray for my mama. She whooped me, beat me. You say we don't spank our kids. Trust me, we all know you don't. Somebody say amen. And 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 and, and mom and dad they they, they 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 finally went and they got this this um, inflatable long punching bag that had the face of a clown 
on the front of it. And it had a little speaker at the bottom of it. And I could wind up. I hit that thing and it, and it would, through the speaker, that clown would start laughing at me. Ha, 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 ha. So I give it everything I got. It'd go back. I said, I got you now. And then, ha, 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 ha. And back up it would come, taunting me. I would hit it as hard as I could. I would knock it down, and it would just come right back up. I finally went and got a knife out of the drawer one day, and I fixed <laughs> the whole problem. But that is how the people of God should operate when hell comes after you and I. Yes, it hurts. Yes, I don't like going through this season. Yes, I don't like going through a battle. But when the devil gives you your best shot, just start quoting the Bible in his face. You may not laugh, but say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Nothing you do to me comes to me until it comes through God first. And if God can trust me with it, I can walk in it. Ladies and gentlemen, get up off of the ground. Quit letting the devil defeat you. God put a dream inside of you to fill the kingdom of God with souls and to win people for the glory of God. You may be in ministry. You may be in business. But whatever your hand find to do, do it with all thy might. But for God's sake, you may not be able to run right now, but walk. And if you can't walk, crawl. But for God's sake, don't just lay down and die. Say, I'm going to get up one more time. God, if you'll give me the strength, I'm going to dig me some wells. I'm going to do something for the glory of God. You put that vision inside of me. You put that dream. God didn't call you to just sit. God's got a purpose, a plan, a destiny, and it's our job to find exactly who God has called us to be. All of us should fall on our faces and be humbled to the core that God would do anything with us. Yeah. We didn't deserve getting saved. More or less him saving us and then giving us the opportunity to serve him for the glory of God. There ought to be something in us that all of us want to be a part of something bigger than us. Going with the current, not against the current. So many people, I wrote this down last night, spend all of their time digging and working and striving concerning things that will make no difference whatsoever in the realm of eternity. How much time do we give digging and sweating to things that are not profitable at all? May God refocus all of us. God, give clarity to my vision and my dream so that I don't spend, listen, give me clarity to my vision and my dream so that I don't spend time climbing ladders where there's nothing at the top. God, give me wisdom, discernment, discretion so that I don't waste my time with things that will not impact eternity at all. What a wonderful life it is to live your life serving Jesus. Where we're putting our treasures up not in a place where moth and rust doth corrupt, but we're laying up treasures in another world. Today, is the anniversary of Preacher Brown going to heaven. I think about him often. I wore one of his ties today, that one that me and you fought over in the gym when we was raffling it off. I said, Al, just quit offering more money. I'm not going to lose this. You're going to cause me to sell my whole house to get this tie. Just stop, Al. He wouldn't listen. I think about Preacher all the time. He, He lived his entire life digging a well on 620 Martin Town Road. 
He lived nearly his entire life. And he never got to enjoy, quote unquote, retirement. He never got to sell off into the blue and go buy him a camper and travel the country. He gave his life sweating and toiling, doing what he loved. And that was pouring into this place. Do you think for a second that Preacher Brown's in heaven right now regretting pouring his life into this place? Right now, I see him walking down the streets of gold meeting people that he won to the Lord years and years ago. And they're telling stories about the service they's in the day they got saved. And I see Preacher Brown kicking that leg up, shouting all over heaven because he refused to allow obstacles to detour the vision that God gave him. And as we can be thankful for that generation that did that, what if I told you that it's, it, it's our turn? God has given us an incredible opportunity. And all of us are going to stand before God and give an account for how we stewarded that opportunity. Isaac had a vision. Isaac had a victory. I only got two points. Y'all hang on. It's 1135. I'm already on my last point. Isaac had a victory. The wells are stopped up every well he digs. They strive with him. They say, that's ours. And he finally goes to another place with all of his herd, all of his cattle, all of his servants. And they dig a well there in Rehoboth is what they called it. And the well that was covered up, this springy water comes out. They found water. They called it Rehoboth and Isaac praised the Lord, built an altar, thanked God because God gave them a place and made room for them. That little part has been bouncing around in my mind for the last 24 hours. That the Lord made room for them. The greatest problem this church has right now is room. Lord, hear our prayer. We're out of parking spots. And I'm not here complaining. I know the problems we have are good problems. But the same way that Isaac had a vision and a victory and he wouldn't give up and he wouldn't quit, you and I need to have that same kind of determination to not give up and not quit as well. Come, come with me for just a second and throw yourself into this text. Can you hear the outside voices talking to Isaac? Isaac, you just got kicked out of a town because you're, you're so blessed. You're so favored. You've got everything a man could want. And all you talk about is digging another well and another well and another... <laughs> Won't you take a chill pill, Isaac? Can't you just relax? Turn your TV on. Get on your phone and get, go on. You just watch some hunting videos or watch some race, whatever. Just, just relax. Ain't you, don't you take a day off, Isaac? Don't you ever chill out, Isaac? Just relax for a little bit. Isaac's like, what you talking about? My daddy spent his life digging these wells. And these idiots come and covered up what my daddy worked so hard to get. And they're trying to say that they own what God gave us. I refuse to just go sit on a couch and waste my time doing nothing. I'm going to give my life to redigging what the enemy's covered up and what the enemy's tried to do. And he said, if you ain't going to get a shovel, give me the shovel. And well after well, it ain't done. You keep reading the text. Go, go, go the rest of this chapter. Go, go a little bit further. And about every fifth verse, every sixth verse, and there they found water. 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 Because Isaac refused to stop. Yeah. 
here we are, the end of August, 2023. And I feel like a spoiled brat sometimes. Because I look around this church, and I see from top to bottom. And I remember when it just feels like a few days ago when y'all weren't up there. I remember we went through COVID and I stood up there by myself. One of the most depressing seasons of my life. I learned to preach to nobody. So I'm a dangerous man now. <laughs> I don't even need y'all's amens to preach. I learned to preach and come down here and say amen to myself. And I learned to go over and get on that organ. Yin, 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 and do it. I could do it all by myself. I don't even need y'all. I remember praying prayers like, Lord, when these people, if, if, if you ever see fit to let us to come back to church together, I promise I won't take it for granted like I used to. I remember thinking, Lord, would you please build a Holy Ghost church full of revival in my generation? While other churches are going into rapid compromise and decline, no power, no fire. Lord, let this be a church that's balanced that loves people, that's not on a political train or a hobby horse train or arguing about stuff that ain't going to matter in eternity, but God, let this be a place where people can get saved, where the altars are always open, people can get help, people can weep, we can cry, we can worship, nobody to judge us. God, please, would you build a church? And here we are, and I look around. It's not just here in North Augusta. But they say when them people would dig those wells in the middle of those deserts, people would come from all over just because they was looking for a drink of water. And today a man drove all the way from Florida looking for a drink of water. What an opportunity that God has given us. And the same way that Isaac could have had voices in his head, just, just slow down. Just stop. Whether it's the part in my brain that looks around at how blessed and how good God has been to us here at Victory. Y'all look, we don't deserve this. We don't deserve the blessing of God. But when the vision side of Pastor CT begins to thrive, and I start getting clarity, and I'm in my prayer time. I, God starts showing me and, and leading my heart and, and through scripture and through the word and through the voices of other people. When, when God starts giving me clarity, I also hear voices like this. Come on, CT. You got a church full of people. Come on, CT. Why can't you just be happy with what you got? Why not just put the gear shift in cruise control and just take a chill pill. That's what Becky tells me every now and then. Could we please just have one night home? Could we just relax? Oh, poor Becky, y'all pray for her. <laughs> I wake up like this. Ready to go. I, go to, I am more excited about ministry today than I've ever been in my life. I am more excited about seeing God do something in this generation than I've ever been before. And I, I go to bed early. I put my little CPAP on my face. I say my little prayers. I say, Lord, help me. And I, I get my little bit of sleep and I wake up ready to go. Why? Because I believe that we ain't got long. I believe Jesus is coming back very soon. And if we're going to do something for the glory of God, we got to do it now. And I hear those voices, whether they're in my head or in reality sometimes. Can't you just relax? Can't you just calm down? Can't you just be satisfied? Well, why do you talk about two services? Why do you talk about three? Why do you talk about buying more land to build a bigger parking lot? Why do you talk about this? Well, can't you just settle down? Yeah. 
No. Another thing I told you to get ready for. Where's it at? Come on, boys. And I remember a couple years ago when, when downtown Larry Brown, my preacher, my hero, my mentor, stood on that stage. And y'all should help throw the picture up there. Just a couple of years ago, Preacher Brown stood up there and held that shovel in the air and said, I want this church to go forward for the glory of God. And I think every now and then, well, we need to calm down. We need to chill out. But then I think about that man that gave his life. I think about a Savior that died for us to have what we have. And I think about what we've been entrusted with. And ladies and gentlemen, yes, every now and then I do get tired. Every now and then. I'm sure you get tired. Every volunteer, every teacher, every deacon, every trust, every person in this room, I'm sure we get tired. But on those days we get tired, on those days we get frustrated, on those days we feel like giving up and quitting, may we remember of, a, of an entire generation that sacrificed and worked and labored to give us what we have today and say, by the grace of God, I can't quit now. I can't let this obstacle stop me. I can't let fear stop me. I can't let frustration stop me. Give me my shovel back, bro. Give me my shovel back and let me do something for the glory of God in this day and hour. I wonder if I got any people all over this room. There are people, you may not be the preacher, you may not be the singer, you may not be a trustee or a deacon, but God gave you a shovel in some area of your life. And may we say together, I will work until Jesus comes. I will labor until Jesus comes. I will fight until Jesus comes. God, give us a shovel. God, give us a place where we can serve God until he comes back. Y'all play softly. I'll quit preaching. All over this place are opportunities to serve God. If we're going to live in the land of working in an environment where we are living in a place where there is room for us, I can't do it by myself. Our staff can't do it by themselves. The deacons can't do it by themselves. The book of Nehemiah talks about a people says this about them, said they had a mind to work from the balcony to the main floor to the internet listen God is God has a plan for this church not just for our generation but for an entire generation to come we are a part of the greatest organization in the entire world called the church a place an organization that Jesus said upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it and I'm praying and I'm believing and I'm trusting God for God to make a way where we're in a place where there is room you say, preach, you trying to build a new building? No, not necessarily. Matter of fact, the last thing on my list right now is building a bigger building. I don't know what the fullness of the future looks like, but I do know if we're going to make it to that. Some of y'all is going to pick up a shovel. Church stats say this, that usually a church is facilitated and operated by less than one-fourth of the church. That means you take this whole crowd and about a fourth of this crowd are the ones that are tithing. A fourth of this crowd are the ones teaching. A fourth of this crowd is the one that are cleaning, working, praying, laboring. What if we could just get that number to half? What if we could, what could we do for the glory of God if our entire church said, I'm going to pick up my shovel. Miss Sarah, sometimes when I want to quit, I start thinking about Tucker and Siler and Everly, the family God's given me. And what I'm doing today is not just for me. One of these days, my little grandchildren 
not soon, are going to be running all around this place. <laughs> I'm not just building for me, Anthony. London, one day our grandbaby's going to be running around this place. And we got to keep digging because they're on the way. Yeah. We got to keep working. You say, well, this is a big church. This church don't need me. I'm so glad you said that. Y'all come help me. My, my shovel men, come help me. Y'all get, y'all come on. This church don't need me, preacher. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. See, this time last year, let me put it in context. This, this time last year, during the summer, our church ran between 900 and some weeks we would reach 1,000 people in our audience and in our crowd, which was up from about four to 500 people in the years prior. And man, I would go home clicking my heels, praising God for how he grew and has blessed our church. This summer, one year later, we ran between 1,200 and 1,300 people every single Sunday. That's, uh, look, I go to churches that don't have 300 people in it. And our church grew by that many just within a year. Preacher Brown always taught us this. He's not going to send people to a church where they're not ready for them. And if God is going to continue to send people here, we've got to be ready for them. And we've got to have labor. You say, preacher, this church don't need me. Shovels. This shovel, let's call it the preaching shovel. Right? There's not just one shovel around here. There's a bunch of different shovels. There's security and medical. Y'all don't know half the stuff that goes on around here. People get sick. People have trouble. We need a medical team that's on, that's on standby all the time. They trade in. They trade out. They, do, they work wonderful together. I have, in my short time pastoring, I have already seen moments where we absolutely needed security to be quick on the scene. And look, as the days get darker, and as this truth re absolutely, as absolutely rejects any idea of stop preaching the truth of God's Word, and as this world hates when a church stands upon the truth of the Word of God, we don't need less security. We need more security. Some of y'all could do that. You could pick up that shovel and help. Uh, here's a good fancy word. Culinary. And coffee. Because here's what we've learned about some of you Baptists. Some of y'all go to church better when I get a little caffeine inside of you. Somebody say amen. We got coffee all over this place. The young adults do stuff, that bougie coffee up there, but then we got other coffee in other places. You'd be amazed how many people it takes every week to get here early, run a little bit of water, put some coffee grains in there, make the coffee, then deliver it down here and put it in different places. You say, well, that sounds insignificant. Listen to me. In heaven, there is no little jobs or big jobs. God is looking for faithfulness. Set up and tear down. Many parts of this church, our school's grown so much too. They're, w w Cynthia, how many's in a school? 283. Learning center, about 80 kids and about 70 more on a waiting list. That means there's rooms that have to operate for church and school. That means there's people that have to flip rooms around so that it's ready for school on Monday. Who's going to do that? Right now, it's the same couple of people doing it every week. But somebody could pick up some shovels and say, I could help with that. I could stay for 30 more minutes and I could help with that. Many hands make light work. Uh, media. God has given us an incredible opportunity through the power of technology to preach to more people than we've ever preached to. When, when the Bible says, go ye into all the world, the easiest way for me to go through all the world is right through that camera. We're hiring media staff doing all kinds of stuff, but they can't do it by themselves. Maybe God has given you an, a, a technological advancement. Maybe you could run a camera. Maybe, maybe some of y'all could learn how to run a soundboard so Steve Bannon could go on vacation at least one Sunday a year. 
poor guy, don't ever get a day off. Because ain't nobody else knows how to do that. Maybe you could run a switcher or a video thing. Or maybe, maybe, there's lots of things in media. Tucker, if you can run a video game as good as you, you can run one of them things up there. Say amen, son. Pick up your shovel. Go stand by Kenzie. Get by the McGoin. Go. Dad says, I always know Dad's serious when he stops talking in English. There's a bunch of young people that can learn and get involved in that kind of stuff. One of the most underrated, neglected ministries in the church is the nursery and the kids area. I know everybody wants to go to church on Sunday. But guess what? There's people up there watching them little babies right now that haven't been to church in months. Because the most least volunteered place we have in our church is the nursery. Now, Miss Cheryl and her team do an amazing job. But we can do better than what we've been doing. Some of y'all can say, I'll give one Sunday a month. I'll give one Sunday every two months. Our church is so big that if the lady, if, if people would say, I'll do one Sunday every two months, get a shovel. You say, this church is so big, I don't know nobody. Get involved. Serve somewhere. Do something. And while you're doing that, you'll start meeting people. And guess what? When you start meeting people, you'll start praying for people. And when you start praying for people, this place will mean more to you. And then when your spouse says, hey, let's go to the lake today instead of going to church, you say, nope, my people ain't at the lake. Nope. My people ain't at the lake. My, my, people, my people's at victory today. That's where I'm going to be. We desperately need people to volunteer to help work in the nursery. Every Sunday, people's going to walk through these doors that have fought the devil all week long. And we need people that are friendly and kind to sign up to be greeters, to stand in these hallways, help us recognize visitors and follow up with visitors. You say, that's not a big job. It is a big job. They say people decide within the first three minutes if they're ever going to come back to a church or not. And many times a nice, caring, smiling face at the front door is exactly what they need to see. For them to be disarmed to hear the gospel and get saved. Greeters, ushers, here's where we're fixing to get to. Our church is so full, the changes we're going to have to make, we're going to have to re-engage our ushers on a whole other level so that when people come in, we can say, you got three seats right here. you got four seats here. We're going to call it the church's CIA agents. I don't, they're, they'll be dre- they're going to be, they know what to do. They know where to be. They're going to have little earpieces in. They can talk to each other. Why? Because we got to have room you could be an usher and the biggest problem our church faces right now is parking parking attendants shuttle drivers golf cart drivers we've been buying golf carts every time I turn around because we trying to spread out and, and get it out through there but that may seem ins- insignificant but they're all shovels and if you're not careful, you'll come to church and just say, man, I, I ain't got nothing to do. They don't need me. That's not true. But more than we need you, you need to find a place to serve. Because may it all be said that we gave of our life to stay busy digging for the kingdom of God. I spent a lot of time praying this summer. Lord, do we go to two services? I still want to do Sunday night church. Lord, how are we going to do all this? The Lord gave me clarity for right now to not go to two services. Because if we go to two services, our parking is so congested, we're still dealing with the same problems. Getting cars in and out. Some of y'all would come to one service and stay for the second because you liked it so much. And our parking is so congested, that's the problem. So here's one thing we've done that I need y'all to help me with. The finance team last week agreed to purchase some buses and some real nice high top vans. And we're going to turn them things into something like Disney World. 
Hammond Hill School right down the road has got 96 parking spots. It's right there. We're going to park cars there. We're going to have those shuttles run there. Maybaum has been very kind. They've got about 40 parking spots right there. That we're going to, uh, we're going to do that. And we're going to have it in such a shape that we'll have tents set up. If it's raining or shining or whatever, we'll take care of all of it. We'll shuttle these people in. But one of the things I need today is on these boards, I'm looking for people that'll say, Preacher, you can count on me and my family to pick up a shovel. And one of the shovels I'm going to say is... I'm going to be one of the about 40 or 50 cars because our staff's going to park here at Hammond Hills on Sundays. So we need about 40, 45 families to commit from now to the first of the year to say, whatever parking spot you give me, let's park a spot number six for the next three or four months. We're going to park there and be shuttled in. We need to relieve the parking lots of about 150 cars. And here's our plan to do it. But today, before you leave, the altar call is going to be a little bit different. Where I'm looking for some people to say, I may not can do everything, but my shovel right now will be here getting here about 10 minutes earlier and parking at Hammond Hills. I know you don't want to, but in eternity, be recorded that you was one of them that picked up a shovel. For some, to park at Maybaum. For some, when we get those shuttles in, they're really nice, too. We need some people to say, I'll pick up the slack and I'll be a shuttle driver down at the church. I can do that. I could be a shuttle driver. Or I could be on the parking team to help get all these people in here. We need room. And we got enough seats in the church. God's blessed us with a big church. Our biggest problem is parking. And I'm here as the pastor asking some of y'all, pick up a shovel whether it's volunteering for a department whether it's saying I'm going to get here a little early and I'm going I'm to drive to one of these places and that's going to be my parking spot for the next couple months may it be said that for now and another generation that we picked up a shovel and we did something for the glory of God now let me be more clear here's what I know Sammy and Sarah here Al and his wife are here your generation has already sacrificed. There's no telling what all this generation has given for us to have what we have. I'm asking your generation and your generation and your generation not to make this generation sacrifice again. Can I get a witness in the house of God? And I'll lead by example. Me and my family, we're going to park off campus. And I'll shuttle in like all the rest of them will. Why? Because it's important that you never know. They tell me all the time, preacher, cars were pulling in and they left because there wasn't nowhere to park. We can't stand for that. Why? Because we're digging wells. And the wells are a life source for people. But if we can't get the life source to the people, then it's all in vain. I'm so glad that when I needed Jesus and when I needed a church, it was available for me. And I know it's unusual. I know it's unnormal, not normal sermon for Sundays. But who knows? One day I may pass this shovel down to somebody else. And may it be in better shape than when I found. Somebody give God praise and give God glory and give God honor. On October the 1st, first Sunday in October, we're going to be taking up what we call a chest of Joash offering. You say, what for? Well, we got to pay for these buses that we just ordered by faith. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Three separate buses. On top of that, the increase, they tell us that we can't put pavement on the new parking lot. We got to do some kind of special surface so that water can get down through it, which is going to make the cost of the paving process four times 
Now, we, we've done everything we can. That's the only way forward. But if one person comes and gets saved, every bit of it will be worth it, right? So on the first Sunday in October, we're going to be taking up what we call a chest of Joash offering. We put a big chest here. I can show it to you where it's in the Bible. And on that Sunday, we're going to take up a big special offering. You say, I might not can do any of that, and I might not can do that. Some of y'all can be good financial people. You can give like other people can't give. But here's what I know. One day in heaven, we'll get to see faces and people who this church had an impact on their life, and they're in heaven. And you may not have been the one preaching, but if you had a shovel in your hand, you'll be a part of that group where they say, thank you. <laughs> thank you for telling me about Jesus. If you believe that's possible, if you believe we're headed the right direction, if you believe we all had to have a shovel in our hands, somebody help me give God praise and glory in the house of God here today.